I think this, the assembly line is the most significant technological development of the 20th century. Nearly everything that we use, we would not have it in the quantities we have it and at the prices we have it without the assembly line. The assembly line moves the world. It is the driving force behind every industrial nation on Earth. Workers and machines organized in a continuous flow of raw materials made into products on an unimaginable scale. I think the best way to define an assembly line is the way Ford did. Uh, he called it progressive production. Work moves to the person and moves past the person rather than the person going to the work. Parts are added until you come up with a final product. And that's what the assembly line is, essentially work in motion principle. Work in motion is as mesmerizing today as it was at the turn of the 20th century. What may look like miles of mechanized mayhem is actually one of the most dependable and durable production techniques ever invented. Today, the assembly line is used to make everything from a two-pound computer to a 94,000-pound aircraft. The Boeing 717-200 will soon be the largest vehicle ever built on a moving assembly line. 300 yards long, the line will move the 100-seat aircraft one half inch every minute and deliver to customers at the rate of one every four days. Boeing's 21st century assembly line reflects the same audacity of scale found in the technique's origins. From the very beginning, the assembly line was first and foremost about the need for speed. Industrial society was highly advanced at the time the assembly line came into being, but once it came into being, uh, it was so productive that very few things were made without the line after that. There are several factors that went into the making of the assembly line. The first had to be that the parts of any product that would be made on an assembly line had to be interchangeable. Interchangeable or uniform parts were first invented in 1813 by Connecticut gun maker Simeon North for his pistol and later refined in the manufacture of firearms. Uniform parts and the simplicity of attaching them to each other was a pivotal innovation in the history of mass assembly. The primary inspiration for putting work in motion originated in the 19th century disassembly lines of Cincinnati meatpacking facilities. The idea being that a uh, cow or a pig uh, was grabbed up by the hind uh, legs and uh, essentially put on a, a moving line and was successively uh, slaughtered, uh, gutted, and then butchered, all on a moving line basis. In the 1850s, simple conveyors developed by textile manufacturers were used to move heavy molds filled with hot iron in the production of steel. Several decades later, can manufacturers created an elaborate system of conveyors designed to move specific work to specific workers on an assembly line basis. And there in can making, you have various machines uh, that are linked together by conveyors, which cans are built, taken from sheet steel and built up uh, into full cans. Henry Ford who built his first car in 1896, was unique among automobile inventors, not only because he sought to build a car for the masses, but because he wanted to build one that was the lowest priced. It wasn't until he developed the wildly successful Model T that Ford began experimenting with available production techniques. By 1908, the nation was on the move, and Ford's need for production speed was paramount. You have to understand the context in which the assembly line uh, took place at Ford. From the time that the Model T was introduced, the Ford Motor Company could not meet the demand uh, for Model Ts. And his goal was never to create the assembly line. His goal was to constantly improve production to drive the price of his car down and but also keep the quality up and, and keep the production volume going up. 
and he pursued this goal relentlessly. Ford regularly rearranged men and machines to improve the speed of stationary component assembly. In 1910, Ford opened the 60-acre Highland Park plant and set up the machinery on the shop floor in the actual sequence of automobile production. This radical departure from the more conventional grouping of machines by type enabled workers to deliver parts more efficiently to each sub-assembly station. He was averaging a doubling of production for several years before the assembly line, but this relentless drive for ever more production at ever lower cost led him almost inexorably to the techniques that eventually developed into the assembly line. Ford then made the giant step of moving the car instead of the worker, based on the principles of Frederick Speedy Taylor. As the first authority in industrial efficiency, Taylor's work was already popular in the steel industry. It was his specific understanding that human intelligence as applied by workers at the point of production was a hindrance to efficient operations. The principles were designed to break down a particular job into smaller and smaller tasks, which meant that much of the task could be controlled, mechanized, and thus speeded up. This process would require more men with less skills. Effectively, he tailorized the work and took the skill out of the work process, dividing the labor, subdividing it again, so that a workman would do a smaller and smaller part of it. And doing the smaller and smaller piece of work, he could do it faster and faster. In April of 1913, 29 highly skilled Ford employees stood next to each other alongside a component sub-assembly line. The line was composed of all the parts necessary to make a flywheel magneto. Rather than assemble the entire component by himself, each man performed a simple, narrowly defined task on the component and then passed the part on to the next guy. Then they said that if this works with transmissions or it works with tra uh, magnetos, what about engines, what about front axles, what about rear axles? And eventually they got all these sub-assemblies on the assembly line. One year later, after Ford had successfully assembled key car components on an assembly line basis, a Model T chassis was pulled by rope across the factory floor. Workers began picking up parts from carefully placed piles of sub-assembly parts and attaching them. When they were finished, they had assembled an entire car in only five hours and 50 minutes. The moving assembly line had cut the production time of the Model T in half. Ford and Ford's engineers took all these ideas and brought them all together and created what we think of as the modern assembly line, but it was really an amalgam of, of all sorts of other ideas, but nobody had ever tried to put them all together and use them to put together something as complicated as an automobile. Fashioned after the conveyor belts used in slaughterhouses, Ford installed the first automatic conveyor belt to move the chassis down the line in a continuous flow. What used to take a man 728 hours to build could now be built on a moving assembly line in 90 minutes. Production soared dramatically from 82,000 cars in 1912 to a staggering 267,000 cars in 1914. With that, Ford dropped the price of the average Model T from $600 to $490. The assembly line created for consumers a kind of abundance that the world had never seen before. The wondrous technology of the assembly line uh, effectively was its under undoing relative to labor. Henry Ford invested millions in machines that mechanized most of the jobs on the moving assembly line. And while the production technique revolutionized manufacturing, workers hated it. It's boring, it's regimented, it's monotonous. It was very difficult to keep a lot of workers in these factories when they first started the moving assembly line. In the need for speed, highly skilled workers were replaced by lower paid, unskilled workers, asked to perform simple tasks over and over and over again. Labor leader reported the comment of a, an auto, a Ford auto, auto worker as saying, if I have to put on nut number 86 
86 more times, I will be nut number 86 in the Pontiac bug house. Work became degraded. Ford believed that mass production on an assembly line didn't require workers to think so much as it required them to keep pace with the machines. A foreman in the Ford uh, engine assembly plant talked about how in his shop, after they introduced line production, what he would do is he'd turn up the speed of the line a notch, and the workers would move faster, turn it up another notch, turn it up another notch, and then the workers would scream and they'd turn it back one notch. They said, we used to get 10, 15 more machines a day by doing that. Workers folded under the pressure. Turnover reached 380% by the end of 1913. And absenteeism was so frequent, it became known as Fordites. In essence, the unskilled workers had become as interchangeable on the assembly line as the parts themselves. Ford once said every part followed a predetermined place through the plant. If you had a person missing from that particular place, the whole system stopped. The Ford plant had 14,000 workers. With a 10% absentee rate, you have to have 1,400 extra workers to fill the assembly lines. People didn't want to do these jobs and it required the bait of considerable increase in wages to keep people in those factories. Ford's response to the growing labor crisis made him a hero. He doubled assembly line wages to $5 a day and shortened the workday from nine hours to eight. By 1914, the assembly line worker made five times more than the average American, whose annual income was an estimated $334. The assembly line worker could now afford to buy the Model T he was building. It worked. Turnover uh, dropped, uh, absenteeism dropped, and Ford workers, you know, sort of traded the high wages for the rotten work. With the mechanical assembly line setting the pace, Ford enjoyed unparalleled success throughout the first two decades of the 20th century. In 1919, the assembly line helped make him the first billionaire. The assembly line has brought wealth and bounty, uh, not just to Ford and Ford's workers, but, but also to, uh, to Americans in general. There is perhaps no greater symbol of wealth and bounty than the monumental River Rouge complex in Dearborn, Michigan. Opened in 1918, many considered the plant to be Henry Ford's industrial masterpiece the embodiment of mass production and the assembly line technique on an epic scale. 75,000 workers tended 53,000 machines along more than 30 miles of conveyor belts, making it the largest assembly line in the world. They manufactured their own glass, steel, and coke for smelting. By 1928, a complete automobile from raw materials to finished product took only four days. I think what happens through the 1920s is that the line and the line speed and the regime of work in the factory becomes harder, faster, uh, more ruthless. But the Rouge factory was a magnet for mechanically minded young men fueled by fresh opportunity. Roosevelt Ford hopped a freight train north from Mississippi after he heard that the auto companies were hiring. In 1921, Roosevelt went to work for Ford. As a skilled laborer, he helped set up, maintain, and repair assembly lines at the Rouge Complex. Back in the days when he uh, was a millwright, Ford Motor Company was the only company in the Big Three that had any blacks in skilled trades. As a skilled laborer, Roosevelt Ford served as an inspiration to his family. So much so that four generations went on to work at the Rouge Complex. Seen here at a recent reunion, the family has a total of 300 years of automotive assembly experience. Strong and proud, they've not only survived, but thrived in the harsh reality of life on the assembly line. It's a lot of pressure on you. I feel a lot of pressure. Repetitive motion and strenuous 
standing up all day. That's believe I believe that's the hardest part because it wears your body out. The line is you want to run is space. You have to catch on. And I don't think you really get the feel of this, even though you can look at people doing it, unless you've done it yourself. You really don't understand. All of the Fords agree that while today's assembly line is different from those in Roosevelt's day, he still helped to prepare them for the job. He used to tell us some of the stories about some of the things that went on before the union got into the shop. If the production line was stopped for any reason, it, it was like an investigation, and it was uh, nothing for a person to be fired to lose their job if they were found to be at fault. Prior to the union, if a person was seen spitting on the floor or smoking a cigarette, they could lose their job. You had to take a little bit of everything. You got out there and did it. You could have been tired, you could be sick, but you had to produce. I came across an account of a woman who said that, you know, my husband is not even allowed to leave to go to the toilet. They have a trough in the work area where he goes to urinate. By 1929, cars were coming off Ford assembly lines at the rate of one every 10 seconds, a pace so prolific, it would ultimately lead labor to organize against it. One of the early demands of the union is that the box which controlled the speed of the line would have two keys, and that both workers and uh, management would control one of the keys. So, I mean, in some sense, what, what they're, what unionization is about is to try to stop and slow down that speed up. While control of line speed would become a cornerstone in the contentious and continuing battle between labor and management, one thing about the assembly line was certain. First of all, it was a job. I had a job. The assembly line did a lot for a lot of people. It was a phenomenal thing, I guess is the best way for, for, for me to put it. The assembly line was a tremendous symbol of modernity, of productivity, of, uh, of wealth. By the late 20s, 43% of the world's goods were produced in America, as manufacturers of all kinds tried to emulate Henry Ford's assembly line technology. If you can make something as complicated as an automobile on an assembly line, the reasoning goes that I ought to be able to make toasters and phonographs and other things which are should be much simpler. They look good, don't they? They taste good, too. Ford's method of mass production, however, required mass consumption in order to maximize profit and minimize cost. That simple formula would ultimately prove to be the undoing of some early manufacturers. But that didn't stop any of them from applying the new assembly line technology. There are new products coming on uh, into the home, appl electrical appliances, uh, which had been sort of uh, experimented with uh, at the turn of the century, but uh, these were going in wholesale into American homes. You have companies uh, like General Electric, uh, Westinghouse, that are beginning to, to make home appliances with moving line assembly. The assembly line allowed not only more stuff to be made, but more complicated stuff, uh, higher quality stuff, things like radios and phonographs, things that had once been fairly high end, kind of abundance, a kind of material abundance that simply people had never experienced before. By 1927, the American factory worker had a third more purchasing power than a decade before. Newly created installment plans allowed consumers to snap up refrigerators, washing machines, automobiles, and other goods as fast as they were coming off the assembly lines, with one exception. Foster Gunnison liked to see himself as the Henry Ford of housing. Uh, he built a, a, a factory that uh, built houses, uh, very simple houses with simple wall structures on a moving line basis. A lot of things that actually went into custom-built homes had actually been mass-produced, things like fixtures, things like uh, 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 bathtubs, etc. that those were already mass-produced. A study conducted at that time concluded that for some reason, 
With regard to housing, Americans, quote, refuse to allow their tastes to succumb to mass production techniques and its concomitant standardization, unquote. Consumers, for the most part, um, have rejected um, mass-produced houses. In other words, Foster Gunnison was out of the assembly line housing business. While American consumers rejected homes built on the assembly line, they wholeheartedly embraced automobiles mass-produced in this way. We talk about car companies so much in this assembly line context because really that's where the assembly line was perfected and grew up and it's where it matured. Ford's original assembly line was designed not so much to build cars as to build the Model T. But the Model T offered precious little choice to consumers and only came in one color, black. Sure, it was cheap, but now consumers wanted variety and General Motors geared up to give it to them. One of the things that General Motors realized was nobody was going to compete with Henry Ford directly on price. So the key was to make a car that cost a little more than a Ford, but offered more than a Ford. And that's really where they tried to target the Chevrolet. What you see in the assembly line, uh, in terms of engineering the assembly line, is essentially working out methods by which you can have greater variety. By 1926, Ford had lost 25% of the market share to General Motors, which was now offering the more expensive Chevrolet in a number of colors with a variety of options. In 1927, Ford reluctantly abandoned the reliable Model T and introduced a new model. It was an enormous wrenching change to shut down his factories, retool them to produce the next car, which he called the Model A and was a, was a very different, much more modern automobile than the Model T. It was a colossal change for them. Uh, not only was it expensive, but there was also a tremendous personnel cost. And they threw a lot of people out. They fired a lot of people, brought in different people. When they began to assemble the Model A, they have tremendous problems making the assembly line work. The switch over to the Model A cost Ford more than a quarter of a billion dollars. Having produced the Model T for 19 years, the Model A required massive retooling for its 5,580 parts, almost all of which were new. It was a painfully unprofitable lesson in tracking consumer demand. General Motors was able to make those kinds of changes much more easily because they had never pursued things as far down that cul-de-sac as Ford Motor Company had. Unlike Ford with its monumental manufacturing plants, General Motors was able to make a variety of cars because they had several smaller facilities with assembly lines dedicated to different models. The annual model change which was introduced by General Motors soon became a rite of passage for American motorists and consumers had their wish for variety and style. After more than a decade, manufacturers had learned how to dedicate their assembly lines to changing consumer demands. And by 1941, during World War II, there was no bigger, more demanding consumer than the United States government. I think Lewis Mumford said that really there's no kind of demand like demand that comes about through, through warfare. Because uh, first of all, you, you, you need a lot of things and you destroy a lot of things. It creates this tremendous demand. Here is the arsenal of democracy at work. One plant among thousands dotted across the vast United States. Detroit's automotive assembly lines transform themselves. Effectively, what you're doing is creating something entirely different. I mean, that process of conversion over to wartime industry is one where the, the whole shop floor is just uh, uh, it, literally in turmoil. An industry which had been geared to produce the 32 million cars currently in use by civilians refocused, retooled, and renewed its commitment to unleash the inexhaustible power of the wartime assembly line. Plants that build tanks like these, huge lumbering juggernauts, in numbers that stagger the imagination. If you look at the history of the war, you'll see that the United States tr created a tremendous amount of war material. World War II also sees the coming in of large numbers of women and large numbers of African Americans. Prior to that time, it was believed that neither women nor African Americans had the skills
to work the machinery and the heavy equipment that was tied to the industry. There's a lot of contention in the auto industry uh, uh, through the war years. Uh, as African American workers are upgraded to the machines and the assembly lines, there are sometimes what are referred to as hate strikes. White workers who would go on strike because they didn't want to see the upgrading of African American workers. And the same thing occurred with women workers sometimes. In spite of an openly hostile environment, the capabilities of blacks and women were clearly demonstrated by their output. This is mass production, as only American engineers know how. By the end of the war in 1945, they had produced 90,000 bombers, 57,000 aircraft engines, a quarter million tanks and jeeps. One of the major reasons that we won World War II was because we were able to produce all kinds of war material, from tanks and airplanes to clothing and helmets, at a faster rate, at a cheaper price, than any other nation on Earth. So we were able to build ships faster than the Japanese and the Germans combined could sink them. Post-war Japan reconstructs the assembly line. I think you could say that Henry Ford invented the assembly line for the car and that uh, Toyota perfected it. After World War II, U.S. productivity was said to be eight times greater than that of Japan, which was ravaged by depression and inflation. The Toyota situation in the post-war period back in the early 50s, they really had nothing in terms of uh, resources. It was a resource-poor country. They had no opportunity, opportunity to waste. Any materials they had, they had to somehow use. In 1950, E.G. Toyota, then a young Japanese engineer hoping to rebuild his family's business, spent three months at the Rouge Complex, the most efficient car manufacturing facility in the world. Unlike many manufacturers at that time, Henry Ford was unafraid to share the unprecedented scale of his assembly line techniques with other industrialists. Ford's assembly line worked great when you had high volume and low variety, hopefully no variety, just one. But Toyota's situation was different. At that time, Toyota Motor Company was making a thousand cars a month while the Rouge was making a thousand cars a day. And that wasn't Toyota's only problem. Here they are making a thousand cars per month. And all those, they had to make all kinds of cars. They had to make trucks, big trucks, little trucks, big cars, little cars, limousines, uh, fire engines, you name it. They had to make everything for the Japanese market. It's necessity that compels the Japanese to redefine the responsibilities of labor in a system that is starved for capital and is only serving very low volumes of demand. Unlike the highly mechanized assembly lines developed in Detroit, Toyota built their assembly lines around their primary resource, which was labor. And to do that, they realized the most flexible thing in the entire operation are people. Not machines, not anything else, it's people. The Japanese never went as far down this road towards making the worker merely a cog in the machine as we did. They were actually using their workers' mind power, and we had forgotten about that. In what was considered a fundamental change in the assembly line technique, Toyota reorganized the work, reduced the waste, and let the workers define their responsibilities in a process called lean manufacturing. Every job that you see on a Toyota assembly line has been slowly and steadily improved and fine-tuned over the years by every operator who's done those jobs. Toyota managed to involve the workers, to engage the workers, and to give them jobs that actually provide more fulfillment on the assembly line. Not only were workers required to define and improve their jobs, they were given a variety of jobs to perform. They do low-end maintenance. They do low-end uh, housekeeping. That means that you have much less support staff in the factory. You have fewer material handlers. You have fewer uh, janitors. You have fewer maintenance personnel. You have fewer inspectors. Toyota said the operators, the plant floor, is in charge of quality. If you have a problem, you stop the line right now. With that, every worker on the assembly line became an inspector. Quality and productivity increased because assemblers were able to make more parts right the first time. The productivity tends to be higher in a lean production plant because you are obligating workers to take on tasks which previously would have been carried out by indirect support staff. 
Toyota also did away with certain specialists on the assembly line, like die changers. A die is a hard piece of metal in the exact shape sheet metal assumes after pounding. Toyota developed a simple die change technique on rollers that allowed workers to change dies in two to three hours instead of the two or three weeks it took at American auto plants. They didn't know exactly what number of different uh, products they were going to be making every day, so they had to be prepared to make those every single day. The Toyota assembly line required that its workers be skilled, motivated, and innovative. Because once production was established, the workers were responsible for continued improvement, a process they call Kaizen. You would remove 10% of the workers, 10% of the time, 10% of the resources that backed up that process, and force the remaining workers to figure out how to now get that job done with 90% of what they had before. And so that would be Kaizen. That would be the continuous improvement element of it. Once they had reestablished a certain balance, then you take out 10% again and you continually ratchet downward the resources available. That is what makes it lean, because you have only the bare minimum necessary to get the job done, and you keep pressing it downward to see what you can achieve in the way of maximum efficiency uh, in, that, in, in terms of productivity. By the 70s, Toyota's assembly lines were well suited to capitalize on the changing demands of American consumers for smaller, more fuel-efficient cars. A severe shortage of oil caught American automakers with millions of larger gas-guzzling models on their assembly lines. There were a lot of people that knew that there were serious problems in the way we were building cars here in this country for a long time. It's quite natural the way that developed. There was a huge market. Um, the system that Ford came up with worked very, very well. Mm -hmm. As long as people were making money and everything was selling, there was no problem. Ironically, Detroit's initial reaction to the oil crisis in the late 70s was one of arrogance and stubborn allegiance to the mechanized mass production assembly lines they'd created. Unlike Roosevelt Ford, who worked as a skilled laborer, and his sons who acquired skills through trade school, Rose Ford, who started at Ford in 1978, was typical of the unskilled workers, whose job depended on surviving the increasing pace of the American assembly lines. To be on your feet 12 hours a day seven days a week was a completely new experience for me. Like a lot of automotive assembly line workers in the late 70s, Rose was determined to survive. At 39, she was assigned to the frame plant. Characteristic of the American automotive assembly lines at the time, the frame plant stressed quantity over quality. I could get very upset sometimes when I could see that the, the quality of the steel, the things that we were producing, weren't really quality, and I knew they were going to be rejected. I had no idea exactly what she was going through until I came to the Rouge Complex, and I was hired on by Ford. Sometimes at night, I would wake up, and it would feel like my hands were the size of a watermelon, and I'd have to open my eyes to look at my hands. Your body isn't made to work at that speed. It just isn't. No part of your body. And I took a tour of every plant in the complex and when I got to the frame plant my eyes welled up with tears to think my mother actually performed this work. I, um, I couldn't do it. You have to be strong to be able to do that. So your mind has to be strong. So I'm, I'm really proud that I'm still sane. <laughs> what they eventually found was that the application of these principles to the moving assembly line, which required extreme mechanization, went too far and pushed the human element in the production process to the extremes, and people rebelled against that. In 1980, Japan surpassed America in auto production, and Detroit reluctantly conceded Toyota's lean assembly line method proved to be an innovative and efficient production technique. By 1989, the Japanese were making cars in half the time and with half as many defects as those made in the United States. For the second time in the 20th century, the automobile industry changed our basic ideas of how we make things. Henry Ford's mass production gave way to Toyota's lean production, an assembly line method that ultimately shifted the balance of automotive trade around the world. The challenge is to make that assembly 
a lot more user friendly to people. So as we future the assembly line, uh, we really become a lot more people oriented. I seen lines that were ran manually with people on every job turn to automated lines and it's steady happening. So it's a big change just in the six and a half years that I've been there. Little did they know that science fiction would become assembly line fact in less than half a century. The first kind of tasks that started to get automated were things like welding and painting, uh, environments that weren't people friendly. Robots were originally assigned the tasks of painting on the automobile assembly line because it had always posed a health risk, while welding required painstaking precision and dexterity. We weren't trying to displace workers, we were trying to gain consistency, quality improvements, as well as actually benefit the worker by being able to take away tasks that weren't pleasant. A fundamental shift toward computer-based technologies in the last quarter of the 20th century effectively eliminated almost 37% of the jobs in automobile assembly line production. Most of the people that are there today are not actually running equipment. They're maintenance people uh, tending the robots. Today, microprocessor-minded robots on the assembly line are able to handle complex materials, select and distribute parts, and discriminate in the performance of multiple tasks in much the same way as a human. We're learning that there are things which computers do better than people, and there are things that people do better than computers, and we're learning how to figure out, we're learning how to, to divide the labor so that we get the best out of the computer and the best out of, out of people. Ironically, it was the increased use of computers and robots on the assembly line that finally convinced Detroit of what the Japanese discovered 50 years ago. The most flexible element of our entire assembly process is people. No longer do we ask workers to park their brains at the door when they walk in. We realize that they're smart. We realize they, know, they have something to contribute. And we ask them to participate in even the planning, the creation of the very line that they're going to work on. But the very lines workers work on are shrinking. In the last decade, mega mergers and corporate downsizing have drastically reduced the number of assembly lines worldwide. Fewer people are assembling more products than ever before, which means that the assembly line workers today must be better educated and more skilled. We've come up with a program where every single one of our employees uh, will be given a computer uh, free of charge to make sure that the people have the right skills to be able to function in this new environment because it is a new environment. A part of the new environment is a virtual factory with computer-generated workers and assembly line. It is the latest high-tech tool in an arsenal of animated assembly used by today's manufacturers. Here's an example of how a virtual assembly line works. Before the Boeing 777 was ever put together in the factory, it was entirely pre-assembled by digital workers with digital parts on a virtual assembly line. Why? Cost of actual assembly. On computer, engineers could actually see how parts would fit together with other parts before the aircraft was actually built. If a virtual part did not fit, it was fixed with a click of a mouse, which is how they solve problems in a process manufacturers call e-build. You can imagine the process uh, um, of building an airplane that size, building every piece that you think will fit to every other piece, putting it together, finding it doesn't fit, going back and redoing another piece. I mean, the cost of building a complex part the first time <laughs> is very, very expensive. So e-build has a lot of advantages there. Virtual assembly lines save manufacturers an estimated 40% of the time and money it takes to develop new products, products driven by consumer demands. The goal of the virtual assembly line is to reduce the time it takes to bring the real assembly line online, functioning, building quality product. The 
That, that's a serious problem because automakers today are confronted with needing to come out with more models in shorter periods of time than they ever were before. The assembly line has to become a lot more flexible. As, as markets break down into smaller and smaller segments, to be able to really maintain efficiency and productivity, assembly lines have to be able to produce whatever the market demands whenever they demand it. Perhaps the greatest change in the 21st century assembly line will be in its relationship with the natural environment. It takes today, or historically in 20th century terms, something on the order of 50,000 pounds of raw materials through the refining and uh, manufacturing process to produce a 3,000 pound car. Well, that means there's 47,000 pounds of waste in there somewhere. There's obviously a huge opportunity to become more efficient uh, as manufacturers and a, as an assembly line and to become uh, a really a superior performer environmentally. On a global scale, we've got 150 plants in 26 countries. Uh, and uh, so if we do something well, it can be very powerful. What Ford invented was right for Ford's time. The way we, we ran production lines was probably the way, the best way to run them at that time. We've got a whole set of rethinking to do now. There are few paradigms in production as resilient as work in motion, symbolic of America's rise to power and Japan's resurrection from the ashes of war. The work in motion on moving assembly lines around the world is a testament to the ingenuity, courage and hope of its designers, engineers and workers.